Hey folks, welcome to MLR Kickoff. It's another bumper show coming up. We will jump into all the action from the weekend. We have a special guest from the New England Free Jacks joining us in just a moment, and then we will preview everything coming your way this weekend in Major League Rugby, as well as always the Professor's Breakdown as he dives into the 101 of rugby. Pete, Professor, thanks for joining us, buddy. How are you holding up? Uh, I'm, I'm doing well, Dan. We're on a roll. We're both at home. I just snuck in this week. I am I am off tomorrow for, for a couple of days. So headed to the great state of Tennessee. Oh, that is a you've, great you've, state. You've, some... you've been to Tennessee? Uh, yeah, I've been to Tennessee. I've lived mm. in the States for 25 years. I've probably been to every state. I should map it out. Alaska? I have been. To, um, no, I've not been to Alaska. Hold on. I that was really that. easy to, to <laughs> ruin your game there. <laughs> yeah, I know. That was, okay, fine. But most of the continental US, in fact, when I was 10, it was my dad's Harvard 25th reunion, and we camped around America for three months. We went to 32 states. Oh, did you do like the National Park Tour? I've heard that's actually quite a cool thing to um, do. I don't think we did the National Park Tour. I think we kind of like drove around because my dad's American, saw relatives, um, all over, like we just drove to see all of our relatives, but it was, uh, it was, um, it was a crazy trip with three boys in the back of an old, um, station wagon that didn't have air conditioning in the summer. Hang on. We, did your dad just say it was a tour and you're actually homeless or did you actually, uh... <laughs> I wouldn't put it past that. Yeah, yeah. It could be, it could be, it could be. Yeah. yeah. It was making uh, memories. It, yeah. Mate, that's right. Making memories. Hey, exactly you know what, what they say, you're only, everyone's, everyone's a bad decision away from being there. So don't feel bad, buddy. I mean, Thank it uh, could happen to the best of us. Well, what did you think of the games on the weekend? Give me, uh, give me a quick overthought of what went down and then we'll jump into the game that you want to kind of deep dive on. Well, I mean, I, it's, it was a really interesting game, right? Because there were some games that were just blowouts and then there were some really, inter- you know, first of all, Shout out to Old Glory. Yeah. Won their first game. I think you may have called it, Dan. You said this weekend's going to be the weekend, although you may have said that for three weekends in a row. No, no, so- no. <laughs> uh, this is it. I, ha- I had a feeling that things were not rosy in Utah. After well, the yeah, I mean, right, both, and- this was, yeah, this was the battle of the replacement coaches. Yeah. Right? So Nate, Nate Osberg versus Brandon Sparks. By the way, both, I think, are very good coaches. Or Nate but- Osborne, maybe. And Nate Augsburg is still playing. Oh, for Nate Diego. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Sorry. Oh, he, he'll make a great coach one day, the other Nate, but he's got a couple of years left playing. He, he does, yeah. So, so Is that the game you want to break down, the old Glory Utah game? It's you want not to... the game I want to break okay. down because I don't think that game has um, playoff implications. The game that had playoff implications for me and that was really close was the Houston LA game. Hmm. Right, and this was a really interesting game. I think for um, this was a really interesting game for LA because this is more of the LA that we're seeing this year, and they've definitely got some problems manufacturing points. Right, um, the Houston defense was excellent. Um, you know, ninety percent, but the LA defense was excellent too. Like they're at ninety-two percent of their tack. Right, but. Um, an extra, what is this? I'm looking at this, 60, 60 tackles for Houston tells you that LA were pretty were pretty dominant in this game. Um, interesting stats, like really, really crazy stats. Some of the crazy stats you see here is that, um, you know, LA were dominant in the scrum. They had 16 scrums. Like that's normally what you would get in a game for both teams. Um, Houston only had seven and Houston lost three of their seven scrums. So that's a little crazy, but they did very well in the lineouts. They had 14 lineouts, they won 13, but nine scrum penalties. So you look at this and you're just like, and so, and you, you look at this and you're just like, how did Houston even survive this? They had a couple of yellow cards, but you go down and you say LA had eight handling errors. So this was a great example of how a scrappy team, even though you look at the stats and they're not doing very well, if they're able to be physical, Right, if they're able to really be a good defense and put pressure on the opposition in the game of rugby, you can compete because you're just not letting them win 
the contact point. And I think that's what this Houston team brings. If they make it to the playoffs, Dan, they are not, they, like, they want to make it an arm wrestle. And if you and, and if Houston can make it an arm wrestle, if they can be, bring that physicality, particularly in the breakdown, they gave away some penalties in the breakdown, but they were able to slow down the LA ball. If you can do that, they're going to be a difficult team to play well at. And they showed that here. And I think Houston's a dark horse for getting into the playoffs and making a bit of a run. It's a, it's a, oh, yeah, listen, it's a log jam on the West because Seattle have a good win over San Diego that keep them yeah. alive as well. I so mean, now you, you, it's, it's five into three, realistically. You'd have to say that Utah and, and Dallas are, are gone. It's, they're, they're not a chance here. So Austin, front runners. Then you've got LA, San Diego, Seattle, and Houston as yeah, your five I, to, yeah. to wedge in. Who, who miss, you have to think Austin's in. I think Austin's point. in, like, like they've basically got a 10-point buffer. Yeah. Like they would literally have to go completely off the rails and lose maybe three games in a row and not get bonus points. And I just don't see that in Austin. They're too good. So I think Austin are in. Yeah. All right. Who's out then? Or who's in? Who else is in? So I think, so, you know, the interesting thing is going to be, and we'll probably, you know, we'll talk about this a little bit, but with LA, are they going to have some more um, – uh, are they going to have some more um, fly half problems? Like, i.e., may have thrown a punch. Um, that'll be something that'll be looked at. So, Alle- allegedly, listen. Allegedly, very- I th- that's why I said may have thrown, may have thrown a punch. Um, and so, for LA, like they can't manufacture points, but they've got an excellent pack. Right, their lineouts improving. They've got a good scrum. I think, I think LA is probably in. Um, mm-hmm. I think they've got too many good players. They've, remember, what they've also got Matt Gitto who hasn't played. Seems to be running around on his motorbike quite a bit. But if he could play the last four or five games, like that's a, that's a big game changer. San Diego, the Seawolves and Houston. I mean, the Seawolves really like put the cat amongst the pigeons with that upset. I think like San Diego, it, it all comes down to health. If they are healthy, Right, recognizing that no, Nate Augsburger, the player, not the coach, um, probably isn't coming back. Right, um, but but if they can stay healthy with some of their big guns, like with Rob Shaw, um, with Mon Nonu, who I think is playing a little bit better, with Basson, like I think I think San Diego probably have a little bit more than the others in terms of consistency. But it's mm-hmm. kind of a bit of a toss up. I mean, we haven't even started, like, we need to start previewing, like, their run-ins and stuff like that. What, there's six games to go? So, yeah. I, think yeah. I think we'll jump into that next week. We're actually going to start looking a little bit more forward towards the finals. But Who do you my think, question, Dan? Anyone stands up for you? First, my big question is if, if the Warriors can have a Panther on a bike, why can't the Giltinis have a Wallaby on the bike? Just let him play. I mean, <laughs> Cole was all over the field last season. Let Gitto get on the scooter and play 10. And just pass and <laughs> boom, boom, zip around the scooter. I, I'd still be going if they had a little scooter, a little get around, my oxygen tank on the back. I'd be having a great time. Uh, I agree with you. I think LA, Austin, the easy, easy kind of slow hanging fruit. I think they'll both make it. I think Austin's run home is actually quite good. There's some good yeah. competitive games in there, but I think they have a good mix there where I think they may have, um, uh, who have they got this week? I think they have New Orleans this week. We'll jump into that later, but uh, very like they've got a couple of really winnable games. Um, right. So, oof, I don't know. I don't know. I think I'll have a clearer picture after this weekend. Right now, I'm leaning towards Seattle, though. So, well, I mean, that's funny because they started great and then they were really not very good. Yeah, but they look good. I mean, I mean, they have too many good players. I think to play it, to continue to play as badly. There was something going on there. They were playing around with their fly half and, you know, they're obviously trying to find out the right combinations. Mm -hmm. Um, But I, I like, like I've always liked Seattle. Um, Like I think, you know, um, I think on his day, um, JP Smith is probably the best scrum half in the competition. Um, I just think he brings so much, so much to the table. And so, you know, they've got, like, Ricard Harding is having a stellar season. I mean, I think they've got too many good players for them not to be in, in the hunt. And I also think I think they've got Utah next, right? Um, you are correct. And so, yep. Yeah. And so, you know, yeah. I mean, I'm looking for let, – let's next week start breaking that down. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, and again, I think this weekend actually will clear some of that up for us yeah. as well. We'll have a, a good little look. Uh, LA have a buy, I believe. So, but again, not much going on there. All right, mates, let's uh, let's keep moving along. I mentioned in the open that we have a special guest joining us from the New England Free Jacks, and uh, it won't take you long to realize this guy is probably the most New England person I have ever met, hands down. And definitely the most new is what? What do you call someone from New England? New Englander. A New, new Englander. Yeah. New England. A new or a free English. Jack. One of the two. A free Jack. I like it. That could be a new thing, Pete. I like it. Well, we were very lucky to catch up with a young man who's played not only all his rugby but spent all his time in the New England area. Cam Davidowitz, who joined us early today. Let's take a listen. All right, joining us now is Free Jack's back row, Cam Davidowitz, all the way from Boston. Mate, not only from Boston, born and raised in the Massachusetts area, you are the ultimate MLR local product. <laughs> we appreciate you joining the show, mate. How are you holding up this year? Thanks, Dan. I appreciate it. Appreciate you having me on. Yeah, holding up pretty well. Season's going well. Nothing yet. So, season's going strong. Coming off the bye. Well, let's let's just talk uh, real quickly. We're gonna we're gonna jump into everything that is, you know, Cam Davidovich, the the whole story. You're like this is your life, the leather bound book and everything. <laughs> okay. But mate, what a year it's been! What a start for the Free Jacks. Uh, can, did you have a feeling in camp this year that you guys were going to come out of the blocks this dominant? Um, no, I didn't really know what to expect going into this year. There's a lot of new faces, a lot of guys I haven't seen. So I was on the squad last year for the train, like training squad last year, the last four weeks. So coming in this year, signing a full contract, coming in, didn't really know what to expect. But, I mean, we hit the gates running, so came out strong. Yeah, it's strong indeed. Well, let, let's talk a little bit about the, the, the background, right? I, I mentioned you are the true New England Free Jack, mate, born and raised in the area. You were, you were un, uh, I was going to say dug up, but you discovered after playing at Plymouth State University. Uh, the Fighting Norseman, as the professor tells me, he's a, he's a huge fan of uh, Norse and Nordic history, so we'll get into that with him in a little bit. But how, draw the dots for me to get to the Free Jacks. How did that happen? I mean, it started, I, so I was playing up at Plymouth State, and then in the summers I'd actually come home. It started, we went to a Montreal trip I did with a uh, uh, mystic uh, college, college side. We went up to Montreal went on a good trip and then Josh Smith, uh, Smith got me in playing sevens over the summer when I was out of school. So I kind of got the ball rolling with Mystic getting involved in there, coming back every summer. And then after I graduated playing with Mystic for a little while, he brought me on some trips in the beginning season, the experimental season for the free Jacks went up to Toronto. That was fun. Did that my junior year in college. So Josh Smith really pushed me along that way. That was good. All right. Go, Pete. Sorry. Sorry. Are we going Norse history? Because I'm excited. We are not going Norse history. We are going Davidowitz history because I want to go all the way back. So obviously a, you know, interesting local product found locally, worked very hard to make it into the Free Jacks. And, and now I think you've, you've played in nine games. You've started three. So you're obviously a solid member of the squad, someone the coach trusts. But I want to go all the way back to when you started playing rugby because your story, I think, could be the future story of MLR and certainly has to be if the U.S. wants to be competitive in 2031 at the World Cup. So tell us how you found rugby and when that was. Rugby back in uh, probably 2011, 2012. I was a freshman in high school and my brother was actually a senior and a bunch of his buddies played for the local club team. So I think they had six different high schools on that one club team. So as a freshman, they all made me kept egging me on to come out, pushing me to come out. And I mean, once I went out, I never looked back. <laughs> that was so, awesome. So, so it sounds like your older brother might be your agent. Is it like, like helping you in your rugby career? Is he getting a cut right now of your uh, MLR? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> we're, we're looking to that. <laughs> Not yet. Is he, does your brother still play? He still plays. Oh yeah, he plays for Mystic. Uh, second row for Mystic, a couple years older than me. But yeah, still plays. They have a... Uh, They've been doing good this preseason. Had a couple of big wins, beat Old Blue, so that's always good. Anytime we go to New York. <laughs> yeah, Dan, Dan, Dan's especially happy when uh, when a team beats Old Blue. So, you know, you, you, you picked up rugby in high school. When, when did you know that you were going to be good? When did you even start thinking about being a professional? I don't think I really thought about it until probably after college, to be honest. I don't even think 
playing D3. So, so even even when you were playing, like like because you went on a free jacks tour to Toronto, right? When you were you even at that point when you were playing All Star, you were like, oh, this was something I could do. I don't know. I always played it well. Like just kept playing for the love of the sport. Like go out there with the buddies, hang out on the weekends. I just kept playing at that level, and then realized what I could do. Probably my last two years in college when I was playing up, I started to see it, but. The last two years in Mystic really helped me push it through. I'll let Dan go. That was my two, Dan. Aren't we two and two? We used to yeah. have this down, and now we're all over the place. I just, yeah. I just, I feel like you have follow-ups all the time, though, and I don't want to step on your toes with the follow-ups. So let's let's talk about last year, right? Uh, interesting year for the Free Jacks. You kind of like get brought into the squad. What were your work on this off season? What were the conversations like? Obviously, Ryan Martin no longer there. Scott Matthew comes in. Mm-hmm. How were those conversations with the Free Jacks on what they needed for you to take the next step in your career? And then what were you doing off season wise to get ready for the season that you've put on this year so far? I mean, the big work work on I'd say just getting up to like the rate of play in this league, getting up there, work rate. But like big things, just keeping it simple for me playing a physical game, strong game, but keeping it to my, like, basics, working on my, what I can do in this league, not trying to be too flashy, not going out there thinking I'm going to carry the team almost, but just working on me. And then um, keep working on the summer, just getting in shape, always fucking working in shape. Sorry for swearing. <laughs> uh, always in God. shape. Right, kids are in bed. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> Pushing it there. Just always being around rugby, I guess, just – always working in the off season, playing sevens in the summer, playing in the falls, getting as much rugby as I can under my belt before coming in here. And who, who have you kind of uh, worked with in the squad? Like, I don't want to say who your idols, because I feel like that's uh, almost a lost term now with MLR because you're playing alongside a lot of these guys now, like running into them on the other side of the field as well. But who have you kind of uh, worked closely with in the playing group who's helped shape your game? I mean, Joe Johnson on the free jacks, he's helped me a lot. He's, Kind of helped me, brought me along, helping me here and there. Joe Johnson, looking up the slate, I mean, that guy's a beast. Anything he does, just look at him and play after his game. So that always helps. But these all these Kiwi boys coming over, teaching me all these little tricks here and there, really helps. So all the back rowers, we stick together. We help each other out. So, so Cam, what was your welcome to the show moment? What was it that you were like, oh, this is a different game? than I played in college or even for Mystic River, which is a great D1 club. What was it? You know, was it a hit? Was it like the Bronco? Was it the pre, you know, you know, preseason? What was the moment that you were like, oh my gosh, what have I got myself into? It was actually the preseason game against DC. I ran a hard down line off a 12 and Junior Seo, I mean, just smacked me. Uh-huh. And it was the wind got taken out of me. And I was like, all right, this is the next thing. I had to lay in the ground. Got the wind knocked down me for a bit, but I got back up. I was good to go. But I was like, all right, this is it. Time to lock in. All right, so let's pair that with what's been a moment that you'll remember so far from this season, like a moment of play, something that you did that sticks in your memory that you'll remember for a while. So I don't want to – your only thing to talk about is how you got smacked by Junior Seo. I want to – I want to get something that, that, that you feel like you, you did well. I mean, my biggest thing in my first try of the season, Harley Barlow kicked it down there for me, just put on there, gave it as fast as I could go. And then once I scored, the crowd going wild and all the boys surrounded me, they were warming up in the try zone, the reserves surrounded me. That was just an unreal experience. Couldn't beat that. That was good. How about uh, how about your influence on some of your teammates? Because like the accent is it's coming through as thick as mine. But have you been a good tour guide in in the New England area, in the Boston area? Have you shown them around? Do, do they understand you know the rules of Dunkin' Donuts now? Do they know how to you know catch yellowfin tuna in season? Like what what have you taught Blue your Finn teammates around here? Was it but, Blue, um, Louis? Sorry. Yeah. Um, no, I don't think uh, Dunkin' Donuts up to these guys' standards. They all like their coffees. They like all like the fancy places. So they're not really hitting up Dunkin' Donuts. Me and a couple of the fellas, we caught a couple of Bruins games, stuff like that. So showing the local sports, tell them what Boston's all about, winning culture, stuff like yeah. that. And then uh, fishing season should be coming up soon. We've got a couple of haddock trips probably coming up. It's getting warmer up here in Boston finally. Winter's over. So we're finally getting out, boats in the water, ready to go. 
Do you know those guys from the show? We're going to totally derail you from yeah. rugby to fishing. I'm on the same dock as all of them. No oh, way. Yeah, oh, Marina right, the what? same flip. Pop what's culture. That? I love it when pop culture collides <laughs> with, uh, with rugby. Uh, who, who, how accurate is the show personality-wise? Like, is Tyler just an absolute grub? Tyler, <laughs> Tyler's the only one I don't know because he's located up in Ryan, New Hampshire. I'm at okay. Gloucester. So I got all those guys like tuna.com, uh, Wicked Pisser. They're all right next to me. I mean, they're all good guys. But yeah, they obviously build up the show a little bit like any show does. But yeah, they're pretty up to it. <laughs> let's, get, let's get you on there. How about you and me? We go on the boat together. I get seasick, so we'll have to figure that out. But we'll, Double we'll, we'll be on your boat. What are we going to call our boat? Uh, right now, we have uh, Farm Boys Gone Wild. <laughs> oh, I like it. <laughs> well, can you do that one? <laughs> my my, grand, we'll my grandparents had a farm, so yeah, I like the farm boys going wild, and we'll just we'll fish in the New England uh, free jack sluggos in the <laughs> speedos. Yeah. All right, so Pete. I, I, uh, well, no, this is this. I'm I'm, I'm doubling down on this because I feel like there might be some off season work for some free jacks, right? Some guys that. From yeah, there's got to be some guys from New Zealand that are like, yeah, like we used to fish at home. We're going to come forward. Is, is, is anyone put their hand up for some off-season work? Oh, big time! I mean, up the farm, there <laughs> fishing. It'll be just perfect timing too. The season, last game of the season is June third. Really, tuna fishing don't heat up till August, July anyway. So I mean, line right up. <laughs> Maybe we can work something out. Maybe we work did something you out. Did you take? Did you take Tom kindly out? Uh, not yet. I got to take the coach, oh. so I have to take all of them up. Oh, because he called me a couple of weeks ago. I figured you guys had gone fishing because he said, I've got a really bad case of the crabs. I just yeah. figured you guys had been <laughs> off fishing. <laughs> you must have got that somewhere else. I was in my boat. <laughs> <laughs> and that was me, and I was going to ask about Cam's trip up to Montreal, but I'm going to let that one go because that's one yeah. heck of a city to go up to as a young, young rugby oh, player, having done that myself. Yeah, that's good. My, I think Montreal might be one of the most fun cities to go on a rugby tour because everyone knows rugby, but that place is just awesome. It is just awesome. It is a big, pretty big rugby town too. I mean, right. teams are always good every time we went up there. It was awesome. Yeah. All right, mate. Let's uh, last last question. I got to ask you about the bus, and then <laughs> New York, New York, the rematch this week. You guys are headed back to Hoboken uh, for round two. There, you got a win last time. Is the bus going to Hoboken? Tell us about the bus, and then what are you expecting from New York this weekend? Oh, man, I really hope the bus is going. I haven't asked my dad. It's kind of getting busy around the farm right now, so these away trips are getting tough, like planting season's coming around. So I hope they make it. We come with a strong crew of 30 like they do every weekend. That's what the bus fits. So they come rolling in there. But, uh, yeah, my dad got that. He's good fine. Someone was getting rid of it. He bought it. We used to have one in college, actually, that he bought for us up at school. And we used to go to every away game up there in college. So, I mean, it's like a tradition at this point. He fills it up. All my buddies come now. All the guys I played with. It's awesome. <laughs> I can't beat it. And then New York and, this weekend. Rematch. What are you thinking? I mean, New York. It's the rival. You can't expect it. Boston. Yeah. <laughs> There's nothing more to look forward to than going to New York. Do you uh, have to explain that to some of your teammates? They don't get it. Yeah, honestly, no yeah. one gets that at all. They don't realize the rivalry is like that intense. I mean, if, with all sports, like right now, the Celtics are playing the Nets. So, like, everywhere you see it, it's always going on. Oh, yeah. How good was that? Kyrie Irving coming back to Boston. Just uh, giving it to him. And you can see even, <laughs> even like that 80-year-old guy in the crowd is laughing as he's sledging Kyrie. I'm just like... <laughs> Man, could you imagine playing in Boston? Like, what a hostile environment. To, oh, yeah, they, in got New York. A, they got under his skin. I mean, that Jason Tatum finish, too. Whew, that was nice. But, uh, oh, yeah, they don't get the rivalry. Like, I try to explain it to them. I think they feel it once we get on the field, just because, like, especially in front of our home crowd, hopefully it's the last game of the season. So, looking forward to that one. We got two away in Hoboken. But we'll go down to New Jersey, hopefully get the win. Well, Cam... Appreciate you jumping on, buddy. Honestly, it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, again, I think we're going to see a lot more of your story in Major League Rugby, and it's going to be for the betterment of the league as well. Good luck for the rest of the season. We'll be watching with a keen eye. Hopefully, you guys go deep into the playoffs this year and you bring another uh, championship to the great city of Austin. Thanks, Dan. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Hopefully, we can do it again. Thanks, Pete. Have a good night. Thanks, Cam. There you go. <laughs> Mate, we've got our off-season plan, Pete. We're going fishing. Let's go fishing. I'm all over. Let's, let's go catch some tuna. 
What a crazy yeah. story. Yeah, full disclosure, um, Tom Conley doesn't have crabs. That was a joke. So anyone uh, in the Conley family or dating Tom Conley who might be upset right now, <laughs> rest assured it was a joke. So TK, apologies. I know he, uh, he loves the show, so I'm sure that one, uh, he'll be spitting the... Try to take do draft so. then, huh? What's that? Oh, it's that's boy, the voice of God comes in. Now I'm in trouble. What have I done? All right, mate, let's go into the professor's breakdown. It's rugby 101 time. What's on the docket today for us? Well, I mean, I think this is really interesting. I think one of the places where Major League Rugby is being um, innovative and maybe more innovative than most leagues around the world is on the kickoff and the kick receipt. And I think some of this is in particular because there are so many players in MLR that have sevens experience for um, the US and for Canada. So if you look at um, kickoffs, right, in most international, the high level international play, they'll kick deep. And what they do to kick deep is they're trying to really pressure you. So they, when they kick it deep, they want you to get the ball and they want to tackle you inside your 22. And so they want you to kick it out and then they get a an attacking line out inside um, the opposition half. That's a really good outcome from a kickoff, right? So if you're going to put that kickoff, you put it deep, you have a really good kick chase, you make the tackle, you don't give away any penalties, you do it inside the 22, make them kick to touch, and you get an attacking platform to come from. So that's kind of like the standard play. But in MLR, what we're seeing is a lot more what are called contested kicks. And that means the kicks are going not as deep, and they're going higher, and runners on the kicking team are trying to get that ball back. So they're running, and because we've got players like Danny Barrett, right, and Martin Yosefo, these guys that have played sevens that are high level, they're coming down, and they're using their jumping ability to get up and try and contest that ball in the air. Now, what you'll see is the really good teams is they actually put a lifting pod. It's almost like it's a line-out. They have a jumper and two lifters to really get height that jumper's moving around, he'll see the kick, and he will try, get, try and get there. But some of these teams, Dan, they're not kicking to the normal spots. They are kicking all over the place. They are looking to win that ball back. And I think it's a really great, exciting, dynamic part of the game. And it makes the try be like, like whenever there's a try, I get excited, there's a try, and then I'm always like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen in the kickoff? Because it's all over the place. Teams are trying stuff, and it is such a momentum killer. So you score the try, right? The, you know, they, or they score against you, you're down. And then on the kickoff, you're able to catch the ball and you're able to start attacking inside the opposition 22. All of a sudden, the team that scored, they don't have the momentum anymore, right? They're on their back foot and they're under pressure. So kickoffs and kick receipts are one of the biggest um, momentum changes in the game. And I think they're one of the more in interesting pieces of MLR this season. It's crazy how tactics are so secular, right? Like I remember being young and the point was... No, you, you don't. That's too long ago. You don't remember being oh, young. I heard, <laughs> oh, my shoulders. But the point with like on a kickoff, it was to hang it right at the 40. Like just go right. 10 metres and, you know, as a young, you didn't have as much control. So you either... You, you, the number of junior rugby kicks that don't go 10 was like 50-50. <laughs> and then it changed. Like, and then it was like, like you said kick deep, kick into the 22, they're just going to kick it straight out, get a line out on their 30 because typically, you, you know, if you can kick to a corner, you don't have a great angle. I wonder if this sort of instigates a change in philosophies with the restarts uh, like that we've seen in MLR, whether it translates across elsewhere as well. Yeah, I think, I think, I think that, that but you're right. It is, it is cyclical. Um, and it's also partly based on the skills that you have on your team. So it's not every team, right? So you've got to have a kicker that can really get height on their drop kick, on the kickoff, and you've got to get a couple of people that have real ups. But like I said, I think a lot of these guys, even if they weren't in the US sevens teams, a lot of these guys played high level sevens and um, you know play sevens in the off season, practice that kind of ability to go up and contest. So mm -hmm. interesting thing for fans to watch out for this weekend. There you go. And now I'm going to tell you exactly where you can watch the games to look to see if the professor was right. And we see sure kickoffs. Let's, uh, let's go over under on the number of kickoffs that go in between the 22 and the 40 this weekend. What do you reckon, Pete? Uh, like number or percentage? 
percentage. Let's do a percentage because the numbers just we don't know. Yeah, we don't know. So I would say I bet that there are um, more than fifty. I think the, I think you say fifty percent, and I think there'll be more than fifty percent. Yeah, kickoffs that don't go into the twenty-two. All right, I'll, I'll take the overs just because I think everyone's going to listen to this and now they're going to be wary of the short kickoff because the professors... Fortunately, we have a stats boy that can track this for us. I, he's full-time employee now. He's too busy for our junk. He's like, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing your heavy lifting. I've got a league to run. I've got players to suspend. I'm not doing this. <laughs> Oh, so kickoff wow. receipts uh, inside the 22 is what you want, huh? Yeah, the percentage. Oh, percentage. Okay. Yeah. We'll see right. what it can do. We'll do it. Um, not this weekend because I am traveling All right. to go Whoa, to the league to the office. Party. Finally. Congrats, mate. Good luck. The move so, to Dallas finally happens. Phoenix loss is a Dallas game. So let's see if um, – Cubes can hook you up. Mark Cuban. So friends just call him Cube. So I was just, uh, you know, me and uh, what was that? What's the line? Jeff Probes and Super Chef Bobby Flay fishing down in the in the Gulf, the Bonita run. That's where you go, Bonita, a big fish. And then and I like, no, okay. Step Brothers, for anyone who didn't pick up on that one, Step Brothers. All right, let's jump into the games this weekend. No, oh, Aaron. Friday night footy. I need it in my life. We don't have a Friday night game. We're jumping right into Saturday. Not only Saturday, but Saturday night. No Saturday games. Like, we are... I've got to wait until Saturday night for the first game. Jeez, Pete. Dallas, at Old Glory, 8 p.m. on Fox Sports Dos, or Duh, uh, for our French-speaking friends. Uh, What are you thinking here, Pete? Um... I'm uh, I'm I'm with Old Glory on this one. Dallas still recovering from losing some of their players. Yeah. Um, Old Glory get their first win at home. It was a scrappy win, 22-21 over Utah. Utah's a good side. I think Utah's a better side than Dallas. In fact, we know Utah are a better side than Dallas. They scored 69 points. Um, and so, yeah, I think I think I think this is a chance for Old Glory to start a winning streak. Just before we go, I got absolutely robbed on Super Brew. One of my picks didn't get logged in. I picked Seattle to oh. beat San Diego, and I didn't pick the margin. I had them by, I think, seven. And I opened my Super Brew, and it said I no pick. And the only thing I got was San Diego to win. I would have only got like one point for it. So, um, Super yeah, Brew. Dan, Dan, definitely, definitely, Ooh. that was all about the technology, not user error at all. I'm absolutely I, certain. I did you nothing wrong. different. All my other games got um, lost. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. That one absolutely. Didn't. So Slip whoever runs, su- who owns, who owns Super Brew? Let's, let's find out. I, I want, I want answers. I want an investigation. All right, moving on. Austin at Nola, the gold mine. It'll be rocking this Saturday night, eight o'clock on the Rugby Network. Now, I think you're doing games this weekend, aren't you? So just no, no games no. this weekend. No games this weekend. Okay, so we're, it's a clean slate. All right, clean who do you slate. like here? Um, I like Austin. I think Nola's struggling, um, and uh, I think I think Austin's the best. I think Austin's the best team in the league. Um, I think New England are pretty close, but I think Austin. Uh, I, I'm taking Austin. Austin on this one. All right, Austin. The you know the rumors of them being bought by another ownership group. What would you rename Austin? Would you keep them as the Gilgronies, or would you change it to something different? I would, I would just, I would keep the AGs. What is just it saying for? Like, and what? Like, like, it's an ag thing. It's a yeah, Texas no, ag people thing. People are going to ask, they're going to say, what's the G stand for? And you're going to have to have something. What's it going to be? No, I think it's about being an agricultural area. It's about agriculture. That's what I would say. Austin's not agricultural. I don't know. Like, what would you do? What would you call it? I don't know. Just something from the... Uh, the Austin Gauchos. Is that, is that something? I don't know. The Austin that's the Gauchos? First, that's the first G thing that came to mind. Aren't they uh, the Mexican Cowboys? Aren't they Gauchos? They might be Gauchos. Yeah, no. They I'm might be Gauchos. To, I think when I learned this, I was in Cabo and I was like four and a half bottles of tequila into the day. So I could be just imagining <laughs> stuff uh, on a vision quest here. But now that I've mentioned I'll go Austin as well. Uh, yeah, even though it is down in New Orleans. 
Uh, Julian Dominguez, his homecoming to the gold mine. That's big right. Game. He'll have a big game. I, I guarantee, he will have a big game. Guarantee it. He will have a big game. All right. Toronto at Houston. This one also at 8 o'clock Saturday night because no one wants to play rugby at any other time on a Saturday except at 8 p.m. Uh, just kidding. Seattle will play two hours later. But this one, um, I think whoever loses this one, their season is over. What do you reckon, Pete? Oh, this is, I mean, I mean, this isn't like, this could be the deep dive because I think it's going to be a really interesting game because you've got a team that's Houston that's really big and physical against what I think is a very good technical team, but not very big and physical Toronto. So I think this is going to be, a, it's going to be down like can Toronto match the physicality and the contact? Um, I think they can. I think Toronto at home is a good side. I think this game is very close, but I think the home field um, edges Toronto. I feel the same way, and I think uh, I think that might make that Eastern Conference run really difficult for Toronto. But um, yeah, Houston Houston looked good in patches against LA. And hopefully, yeah, they take but- the positives and build on that. You know, I think what what's really interesting is, um, you know, and we said this, things are really going to sort themselves out, right? I mean, Nola are probably done, but if but if they could win a game, and Toronto lose and New York lose, they they they're within touching distance, right? Um, and Houston, you know, even if Houston lose, they're not out of it, but. You know, I I just think that I think it's a it's a bit of a trip for Houston. Um, Toronto in April at an eight pm kickoff is probably going to be a little chilly. You would hope, in fact, that it's in Houston. Might... Is it in Houston? It's in Houston. Oh, yeah. thank you. Sorry, we've done the at here. So, hmm. all right. So I got it the wrong way round. So then I have to go with my home field advantage, um, saying it's close and home field wins it. So now I'm going with Houston. I, you did go for Houston to start with, I thought. <laughs> Where, I've been all over the place going, in this one. What's going on? I'm trying to pull up the tables really quick. I'm, bear, bear I have the tables me, in folks. front of me. I have, I have, I have the tables in front of me. Okay, Toronto are in third place now, equal with New York. New York have a game in hand. Um, yeah, mate, Noel's 11 points back from those two. I just don't see it. Even if, even if they both win and they get a bonus point and they don't, they're still six points back and... Yes, uh, I'm just, yeah. I want to see it, but I'm not seeing it. Houston is only two points back in the West, so I guess they could drop a game and stay alive. So yeah, yeah. Maybe I mean, being a, but a I'm, I'm going with tomorrow. my home field. Yeah, I'm going with my home field advantage. I think Houston are going to be more physical than Toronto. I think that physicality means Toronto can't score very much because they can't play the fast game they want to play. And if they can't play their fast game, they really struggle to generate points. So I am going to go with Houston because they're the home team. All right. I'm not going to tell you the next game. I'm just going to do a, a 90s reference here. It's Sean Kemp versus Carl Malone. Who's playing in this game? Oh, I mean, I actually know this part of basketball, right? Good. Like, I, I follow basketball at this point. This is when I came. So, um, it is uh, Seattle. Yep. Super right, so Sonic. Supersonics and the Jazz. That's who it yeah. is. Yeah. Sean Kemp was my favorite player. I had a Sean Kemp jersey. And uh, Sonic's hat and the shorts I had the full outfit, the hat, the the singlet, the jersey, whatever they uh, call it, and then the shorts. And I think I wore them for about three and a half weeks straight um, without washing them. So big fan. And then I don't know what went wrong after that. I just fell out of love with basketball. Uh, turns out Sean Kemp um, still up there, still in the Seattle area. So kick goals. Shout out to Sean. Hope you're doing well, buddy. Uh, Good player, good player. I think he grew up in Elkhart, Indiana. That's where he's from. So there you go, random fact for the day. All right, um, who do you like in this one? Good, uh, pretty good rugby area, Elkhart, Indiana. They've got a really mm-hmm. good uh, rugby complex there. So mm-hmm. another little known, even, even less little known fact. Yeah, uh, RV capital of Ryan Ginty. I was about to say the exact same thing. RV capital of the world. If uh, For those of uh, the listeners who are up in the Steinberg ionosphere of age and looking for an RV to retire and travel around like Pete's dad did with the kids when they were homeless. Um, oh, we wish Indiana. it was an RV. We yeah. wish it was an RV. It was like an <laughs> old station wagon without... An RV would have been fun. 
Three boys uh, in the back of a station wagon. Oh no, not the fun. same tape on repeat. Side A, <laughs> side B. Yeah, I've been I'm there. Pretty sure the tape player didn't work. I right. listening to AM radio the whole way. Utah, uh, right, Seattle. So, this is a tough one. Like I think Utah are a good side. Uh, you know, they've gone through what, what you know, Seattle have been so inconsistent. Mm. This is uh, this is this is a tough one to call, Dan. Um, like my my head says Seattle because I said like I think they've got too many good players, but Utah at home, like overcome like the loss of Sean Pittman, obviously an important coach. Like the first real week of them preparing, I think Utah are going to be better. I but you know I think I think Seattle have more to play for, so I'll, I'll give it to them. Yeah, I'm I'm in a hundred percent agreement with you there, Pete. I think Seattle with. Uh, playoff implications will we'll drive them on here. They, I think Seattle actually have the better of Utah on the head-to-head throughout the history between the two sides. Um, I think it was one of their only wins last year was in Utah against Utah. So they'll keep that trend running. Seattle for the win here. All right, Sunday, two games on Sunday. Uh, the big rivalry game. We, we talked to Cam about this one, New England versus New York. It's the return to Hoboken. Uh, this is going to be our big game preview, Dan. Oh, we're not going to do the other one? I thought we are going to do... Um, oh, you want to do rugby Houston. ATL and... and... No, you no. picked about three games for your breakdown, but... All right, we'll do this one. New England and New York for your breakdown. I'm locking. Boom, locked in. No Boom. changing. All right, uh, last game is Atlanta on the road to San Diego. ATL coming Ooh. off the bye. Runs into San Diego coming off a tight loss to Seattle. Who do you like here? Oh man, this is a, this is a tough one. This ATL side is good. Feel, it feels like San Diego needs to win this. Does it feel like San Diego needs needs to win this? View it's a long oh. trip for ATL, but they did they, have the they bye. In, they will know at this point. Uh, they they will definitely know because Seattle Utah game will be over where they stand, and Houston Toronto will be over. So they could be in as bad as fifth place by the time this game starts. So yeah, it could be a oh, game wow. they need to win. Yeah, so they this is a game they, they need to win, but this ATL team's pretty good. Um, I think uh, the Legion is, I mean, the Legion's five and five, right? And ATL's seven and two. Seven and two, probably, yeah. yeah. probably a fair reflection of where they are. So I'm gonna go with ATL, even though it's a long trip. They didn't have the buy, it might be the difference because without that buy, as you know, Dan, that's a long trip across the country and that you lose a day of recovery, you lose their prep, um, but I think ATL, I think San Diego is going to be a little bit beaten up after that loss to Seattle, especially coming off that turf. Mm-hmm. Um, some old, some old legs, right? It takes a little bit to overcome that. So I'm going to go. I'm, I'm going to go with ATL. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm going with you here as well. I don't think uh, the road trips is bad when you've got a buy to kind of rest up and get yourself set up for that one. But oh yeah, well that that'll be interesting because. Like I said, by the time that game starts, San Diego will know where they kind of sit on the West, and we are getting close. I'm actually going to enjoy doing the, the preview with you, Pete, yeah. for the playoffs. It's going to be cool to jump into the, the math, and maybe maybe we should have our boy um, Scary Larry join us for some of his algorithms for that one as well. Oh, we can, yeah, yeah, yeah. If we can squeeze him good. in, maybe not next week, but we squeeze him in in the run of the playoffs to kind of will allow Larry to spend a short period of time in your lab to, to do some research, obviously unpaid research, because we run a tight ship here, um, and analysis, and we'll go from there. But now let's break down the game. It's the rivalry game, New York, New England. Doesn't get any bigger than this, does it? No, it doesn't, but Dan, I'm gonna start with a question for you. Go. What is New York doing with Andy Ellis? Um, judging by his Instagram, letting him go to Nashville, have a great time. <laughs> Which I would have done too if I was Andy. Geez, Nashville looks but, like an absolute blast. I've never been to Nashville. Got to go. Really? Oh, it is. Yeah. It is a blast. It's a blast. It's one of those great like uh, music cities, right? Yeah. Um, so, is Andy Ellis going to play nine for New York? Have they been um, like just getting depth because they've got like they've got a couple of nice young nines, but I don't think they're Andy Ellis, and I think that's really hurting them because I don't think they're able to generate enough points and play yeah. as quickly as they can with the other guys. It's a good point. So I'm wondering if they're just, they've, they've just been developing depth and at some point Andy Ellis is going to play nine, or if they really think that 
the best place to play a former All Black scrum half is, a, is a, as a backup tech. Ooh, what are you doing? You start. Listen, I. I have always. A, yeah, I've, I've always erred on the side of you don't weaken another position to strengthen one that needs help. So if you've got a really world class nine, you let them stay at nine um, and then find a solution at 10, as opposed to weakening your nine position to just basically gorilla tape your what? 10 position. So. If he's good to go, I start him at nine from now on out because, again, even if you can get 50 minutes out of him, I, New York just have been like blowing off the park in those opening 50 and maybe that's where you need some leadership like Andy possesses and some yeah. game smarts to control the tempo of a game. So, I don't know. Yeah, that's I mean, it. it's, it's an interesting question because I look at the stats and, you know, we've talked about how good New England is and New, New York's not that far off, right? Um, they've struggled with goal kicking when they don't have Sam Winston they don't really have another goal kicker so so, so that's a challenge but you know as I look through um, exactly the same tackle percentage uh, New England are a more physical defence right so they have 91 dominant tackles and um, uh, New England only have um, 37 but um, they've uh, New England have had more possessions that have had to make less tackles, but still, they're a little bit more physical. Um, same number of defensive turnovers, pretty much 50 to 57. So they've both played nine games, right? So we can compare the absolutes. Um, 28 breakdown steals to 24 breakdown steals, um, 11 scrum penalties to 13 scrum penalties, which is a really great way to look at how well your scrum is going, is if you look at the number of penalties that you've conceded. Um, line outs, it's an area where um, uh, um, it's actually pretty close in lineouts. Like lineouts are pretty close. Um, New York has had more turnovers conceded, um, but this is a really like penalties conceded ninety six to ninety eight. This is a really, really um, close game, and 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 so I think that difference of like really making sure that you play your best players in the best spot. And also they've got, um, you know, some guys that have come back, uh, um, that are coming back into that pack. I mean, I don't, I don't think I'm going to pick New York, but I might pick New York. It depends yeah, you, on that lineup. Well, second, the Holo has also been signed. You have to think he's going to start. Yeah. It could be an interesting battle between him and Mitch Wilson. Mitch at about a, a buck 75 and the Holo probably like 245 right now. So, yeah. Um, but I've, you know, I've been super impressed with Mitch Wilson. I, I'm sure he's up for that challenge. Uh, yeah, I yeah. Be, I mean, I, I'm like, sure I he think, is. And, and and it's such a big like like because we've looked in New York. You know, what did they do? They, I mean, they had a stinker against LA, right? Mm -hmm. And that that kind of I think coloured like the view of of a lot of us. You know, they lost forty three nothing. Um, and then they have their bye week, which is good. But, you know, and they beat, um, they beat Old Glory, that 35-31 game that was super tight. Yeah. Um, they lost to Toronto at home, 10-14, but Toronto could be a good team. Um, they beat Nola away. Um, they beat San Diego at home. Um, and they lost to the Free Jacks, right, in the in, um, at home in New Jersey. The other game, 38-29. Um, so there's going to be some revenge there. I mean, this might be a game that I think New York pulls off. Like, I think New England might be a better team, but I think things might be going for New York. Yeah, maybe, maybe. They've got everything to uh, to aim up for. I mean, Nick Savetta is, is was announced yep. back as well, so uh, that makes them a lot more dangerous to line out where they struggled significantly against New England last time out. Um, just see how healthy they are, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I mean you I can think, have Windsor yeah. at 10 and Heighton at 15. I, I don't know if uh, Troy Lockyer, uh, looks like he got banged up again in that LA game. I'm not sure if he's going to be available or uh, is, is Heighton back or is he, he's, he's kind of been in and out of that lineup with injury. So just a okay. question mark who they can pick. Let's just say, let's just say, I think so the last game of the season, right, um, and for, for these teams is the return triple header, whatever this is, where New York yeah. finally travels up to New, up to New England, right to to Quincy to Veterans, Veterans Memorial Stadium for that game. 
we want that game to mean something for the playoffs therefore we should probably be pulling for New York to win yeah. right if you don't really have it because then it's going to close everything up and it's going to make the run in a little bit better imagine if New England's locked up at that point and all they can do is kick New York <laughs> out of the playoffs what would they do <laughs> oh my gosh what a selection right well it depends what you mean by by um, lock, locked up right so if they've got number one seed locked up and they've got that mm. buy then they can play whatever they want but if they're like locked up number two or they're not sure which one it is then there's a lot more to play for oh yeah cute. it's spicy the east is spicy i love it it is no. spicy i don't i don't know who to pick here because i just want to look at the rosters i think I'm, I'm okay with that i think both of us this is going to be one of these games where i think roster selection is going to be critical yeah, I want to see where Ellis is, if he's starting at 9. And if you go Ellis, Windsor, 9, 10, Naholo's playing, um, I mean, he's going to want to have a big showing. You know, first game yeah. in the US. and So he'll want to have a big out. And uh, God, how about those wings? Naholo and Fado. <laughs> it's just like, oh my gosh. What happened, what happened to the wingers of old? You know, the, you know, who do you run out there? Can you imagine that? Like those two guys coming at you? No, thanks. No, thank you. No, All thank right, you. Pete. All right, Pete. What a show. What a weekend coming up. Pleasure always, buddy. Final thoughts for the weekend? Hey, I, games are beginning to count. Um, I'm not sure how I'm going to watch three games at the same time on Saturday, but I will, I will do my best. Games are going to count. Games are really, like, it's going to have an impact. So the pressure at the last 10, 15 minutes, and don't forget, Watch the kickoffs and kick, kick receipts for the momentum changes. We love it. Thanks, Professor. For Pete Steinberg, Aaron Castro, Ryan Ginty, our entire team here at MLL Kickoff. I'm Dan Power, and we'll catch you next time. <laughs>